Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for introducing me. My name is Duong Kim. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our recent work, uh, Breaches of Trust in a Windows Core Design BKI. The research work was done with Bam Jun Khan and Dr. Tudor Dimitrash. So we, um, so suppose that you are given two files and the two different, uh, two different uh, publisher names are shown to you. Which one? Uh, the one is from generated by unknown publishers, and the another file is generated by Mozilla Corporation. So which one looks more trustworthy? So people tended to believe the file in the bottom is generated by Mozilla because the code signed PKI is provide authenticity of the publishers and the integrity of a program code. So, so we can know that the file came from the Mozilla and the corporation and the neighbor altered. How can the clients establish trust in publishers? The, uh, the, the trust between them is based on the certificate. The certificate first, in, uh, certificate was issued in CA. After they carefully verify uh, the inter uh, identity of the publishers. And then the publishers use, uh, sign the program with their private key and appends the certificate associated with the private key to the program. In the client side, when you do execute a file, they verify the signature by matching the hash of a binary. And they also needed to verify signatures using a chain of CA. It's a code also. Um, the chain of the trust. So we can, because the clients have a pre-installed uh, root, root certificate in the client side, so we can know that the clients trust all the certificate of publisher issued by CA, and also the program code signed with the certificate. However, the breach of the trust occurs because of a two, uh, pro uh, because of the problems or weaknesses in the uh, each actors, let's uh, take uh, some example. In the first, in the CA side, the one of the example is a very side in 2001. In a uh, by mistake, a very side issued two certificates with the common name of Microsoft corporations to adversary who claim to be Microsoft employee. It is caused by CA verification failure. Not only CA breaches the trust, but publisher also breaches the choose, trust. The first example is the Stuxnet. The Stuxnet is identified in 2010. It was a very sophisticated target attack, iron nuclear facility. The malware properly signed with the two certificates belonging to Taiwanese company. It is likely that the private key associated with the certificate are stolen and used to sign Stuxnet. So another example is the CCleaner. CCleaner is a tool to help the users optimize their computers. So however, in the last September, CCleaner had a pay malware payload and affected millions of users because the CCleaner properly signed and it, it is distributed on the last minute website. The last minute sign the CCleaner means that developer infrastructure is likely compromised. Uh, from this anecdotal example of a breach of trust, we can know that the breach of trust occur in a code sign PKI. However, the breach of trust is never systemically measured yet. The breach of trust in a code uh, code PKI is well studied so far, and in those studies inspires the other researches for improving PKI, such as CT and convergence. This is because the TSL or TLS certificate systematically collected through network state uh, scanning. In the code design PKI, there are a few uh, prior works. Their work is uh, focused on the POV files, so the used certificate are likely issued to POP author. So breaches of trust is not studied yet. So we have uh, two challenges in our work. The first, systemically collection of the code sign certificate, and the second, identify and eliminate the approach of the trust in the code sign PKI. So that was our introduction, and this is the outline. The first, we're gonna introduce a new threat models 
for a breaches of trust in a Coruscant PKI. And then we briefly overview our system to overcome the challenges. Finally, we will discuss what we found in our work in two ways. First, characteristic of signed malware, and we also identify where and why the breach of trust occurs and what caused the breaches. In a published side, for adversary, they, want, want, they don't want to reveal their identity for their malware, and they want to install their malware as many end users as possible. So they are trying to steal private key associated with others publishers certificates or compromise developer machine so that they can put their malware payload into resume source code like CCleaner. So similar to the publisher side, for hackers, they don't want to reveal their identity so that they issue the certificate with uh, by the pers impersonating other publishers or establishing a shared company. In the client side, the client program including operating system or AVs should block malicious file. For adversary, they want to bypass the client side protection such as AVs. So they are trying to exploit the flaws in the signature verifications and enforcement. So, two major the breach of trust, we had the major challenges. It is how to identify obvious cases. So we devised a new algorithm to identify obvious cases. First, we need to need, uh, we need to uh, collect the signed malware and check they are properly signed. If not, we consider them malware signed with malform signatures. If they are properly signed. They move forward, we move, we move forward to the next step. In the next step, we also need benign samples to group all the samples by, uh, by certificate to identify obvious case. In this group, only malware is found. We suspect the samples are signed due to the impersonation of a shared company. In this case, only malware in the found in this group since hackers are using it for signing malware as seen in the very signed 2001 case. At, but the benign and the signed malware are found in the same group. We suspect that they are caused by a stolen private key. So for example, Stuxnet, the malware are signed with the Taiwanese certificates and the certificate also uses for the legitimate owner of a certificate to sign their benign program. So both the malware and the benign samples are found in the same group. So the, another challenge is the how to collect the signed samples on the end user's machines. So we first collect the signed potentially malicious file using Wine dataset. Wine dataset is a telemark data collected by semantic product on millions of real end users. So we query virus total to get the code sign certificate information, such as a certification, a certific a certificate serial number, and issue day and expiration day. We also to get the AV detection re uh, result for each binary because AV detection result suggests that it is malware or not. So after collecting the signed potential malicious files, the malicious file could include the PUPs. So we filter out the, all the PUPs with three conservative, uh, three conservative criteria. So our new algorithm we present in the previous slide is applied in the last step. And the, for verification, so we contact the owner of the compromised certificate for confirmation. So let's discuss what we found in our work in a two ways. First, characteristic of signed malware, and the second, where and why the breach of trust occur and what causes breaches. We have a five research questions. The first, one malware type of user code sign PKI. And second, who control the compromised certificates? And third, when did abuse start? Fourth, how long compromised certificates remain a threat? 
last research question is what PKR weaknesses do adversary exploit in the three actors? First, uh, published side, and CA side, and client side. Here is our set of assigned malware we found in your work. There are two groups. It's a properly signed malware, and second is not properly signed samples. So the second column is indicate that the status of current, uh, uh, current status of certificates. And the third column is the number of malware, and the last column is the number of to uh, total number of signed samples. So we found 189 signed samples out of 150,000 signed samples because we are more conservatively identifying malware than prior work. So we got a relatively smaller number of signed malware. So we found abuse cases such as Stuxnet or Induct A in our data set. We also found that new abuse cases the new obvious case can be categorized into two. The first is target attack malware, and the second is typical malware. In a target attack malware, a likely signed, well, signed with a single certificate. For example, Shyla is signed with a, a single certificate and is a bank control gen target only against the customer of the UK. However, the malware, the typical malware, signed, are signed with uh, multiple certificates, so such as Dropper, AV, Fake Avis, and Boots. So we also wonder who control the compromised certificates. So we found that large reflection around 80% malware family relying on the single certificates, which means abusive certificates are likely controlled by malware authors. The Stuxnet is widely known as an example of signed malware, but we found that the signed malware is common before, before Stuxnet, and the earliest samples was signed in 2003. The 189 samples as malware signed with 111 unique certificates. Of 111 certificates, only 23% of certificates are revoked. In other words, most case, most certificates are not revoked yet. And the not revoked certificate remain threatened even after expiration date. So in the previous slide, as mentioned, the proper signed binary sample can remain valid even after expiration date, unlike the TLS, because of trust timestamp. Let me briefly explain what the time step, trust the timestamp is for those who are not familiar with trust the timestamp. The timestamp is the process of keep track of keeping track of trust the creation time of a program. The when the publisher signed the program, the publisher signed the specify a trust the timestamp in servers. And the timestamp server send it back to the publisher the current timestamp, and the current timestamp is a fixed binary. The object timestamp will tell us that the program was assigned when the certificate was valid. So it extends the trust in the program, in the program code beyond the expiration date. So, so signed program can be valid even after certificate expiration date. Why do you need, why do you need a trusted timestamp in code sign PKI? Because code sign certificate is valid just one year usually one year. However, programs are usually used more than one year. So if the certificate itself has expired without time stamping, we don't have way to know when the application was assigned when the certificate is valid. So unlike a TLS, the code science PKI need to trust the third party asserting that the signature was added when the certificate was valid. However, the trust the time stamping caused another serious problem. The malware can be remain valid even after expiration date if they are properly assigned and the trust the time stamp. We wonder how long compromised certificates and survive remain threat. 
So we've heard from uh, survival, survival analysis using Kaplan and the Mayer estimator. So it is used to estimate the survival function from lifetime data. The X axis is, is the number of days from the first day of signing malware until the last day of the compromise certificate is not revoked. Y axis is the probability how many certificates are not revoked yet. On the first, first sign of day, the probability of, probability of a certificate is not revoked yet decreased to the 96%. The for example, on 1,000 days, after certificates the first use signed malware, around 86% of certificates are still not revoked yet. Then, 80% of use of certificates remain threatened over 5.6 years. We have seen so far the characteristic of signed malware we found in our work. Now let's take a look into detail where and why the breach of trust occurs and what causes breaches. At the, at the beginning, we mentioned before, the clients tend to believe a signed program code is generated by legitimate publishers. The for example, program is assigned with the modular certificates. We tend to believe that the program comes from the Mozilla. However, the program signed with Mozilla certificates can be generated by hackers since the breach of trust can occur due to two problems in a publisher side. So first one is a stolen private key. The Stuxnet is a representative example in this category. So in this case, publisher should have to keep their private key safe but due to some reasons, hackers stole, steal their, uh, their private key and they used sign their malware. So most cases are the belonging to this category. The second one is infective developer machines. The CCleaner example is belonging to this category. So in the A malware target only Delphi developer machines. And we found that three certificates are used to sign malware in our data set. We investigated how prevalence of the malware in the wild using Wine data set. So we found 93K machines were infective, only 180 are DeFi compiler machines. So which suggests that infecting developer machine is a very effective way for implementing impact of signed malware. For verifications, the result we found our work, we contact the owner of a compromised certificate to inform them their certificates are used for signed malware and to better understand the code sign ecosystem. So we received eight replies and all of them told us that they owned the certificate and used, used them for sign their benign program. Uh, three of them already aware, aware of that or over this issue because the CA notified them of this issue. However, five, still five, didn't recognize that their certificates, like, uh, certificates are compromised. Two people give us a very valuable feedback to us. One person is told us that the private key can be stolen because the private key was stolen in the development machine, so we're Anyone, can, anyone in the company can access this. The second one is that he, they didn't keep track of the expired certificates, which means the, they are misunderstood the code sign PKI. So the CA verification fail caused a breach of trust like a very sign 2001. The CA side verification failure occurred to problems, identity theft and the shell company. The most cases identity theft categories are the companies are not related to the software development, but they're less than made the certificate issued and design the malware. So we discovered a certificate was issued in name of a delivery service in Korea, and the, another certificate is issued in the name of a real Oregon resident. So we 
believe the hackers don't want to reveal when they issue the certificates. So the Oregon resident ID was stolen and used to issue the certificate. The hacker, hackers also established a shell company to, um, to issue the certificates. The CA should carefully verify the identity of publishers when they issue the certificates. For example, if a company is not related to software development, they should double check their identity. We discussed uh, the weakness in the two actors, publishers and the CAs. Last problem is the client itself has a weakness in a code sign PKI. As you can see the table, the number of the sign, uh, number of malware with the mouth from the signature we found is a two third of signed malware. We were wondering why many malware with the mouth from signatures are found in our data set. So we raised questions that it can be that the CA side protection, such as AVIS, may fail in detecting malware with the mouth from the signatures. So, we conducted an experiment to determine if the simply copying signatures from, from ad, other binary called malform the signatures can affect the AV detections. So we downloaded five samples, including WannaCry, and they are detected as malware by 56 or 58 out of 63 AVs in a viral photo. So we randomly picked two certificates. One of them is from a well-known company, and the another one is from a very small company. So then we simply, co simply copy PKCS7 into the unsigned samples. When verifying the copy the signatures, hash of the unsigned sample is not the same as hash of the signed benign program. So the malware signature cannot be valid. So no matter what the signature added, the behavior of malware are still remain. The a AVs are supposed to detect them as malware. So we uploaded a total of 10 samples to virus total. However, we found that bogus signatures can prevent many AVs from detection malware. So in this table, first column is AV name, and the second column is the number of unsigned malware undetected from zero to the five, since we have unsigned, five unsigned samples. And third column is the number of bogus malware undetected from zero to the 10, because we copy two certificate to each five, each five unsigned samples. Total, in total, we have uh, 10 malware with the bogus signatures. So around 60% of the AVs are effective, and the VT, uh, virus total detection rate is reduced by 20%. So even well-known company, Microsoft, Sophos, Kaspersky are effective. So we reported this issue, the effective AVs company. Two companies confirmed that issue, and then one of them told us that they were going to fix it soon. So also. We realized that after our paper submissions, a ransomware called Pet, not Petia is identified in the end of June 2017. The malware had malformed the signatures from Microsoft to avoid the antivirus scanning. The so clients should have a protection such as AVIS to prevent from malware. However, we can know that malformed signature can help avoid AV detection. Here is the conclusions. So we are the first to systemically measure the breach of the trust in a code sign PKI. We introduced new threat models in the breaches trust in a code sign PKI. We found the signed malware was a prevalent before Stuxnet, and 90% malware rely on the single certificates, and which means they are controlled by malware authors rather than third-party signing service. And 80% of used certificates can survive for over 5.6 years. So publisher name and the issue name and the serial number we found in our work is available signed malware.org. Thank you.
I'll start with one. So, um, other than tricking malware, uh, excuse me, other than tricking antivirus engines, yeah. uh, why do malware authors go to these great lengths to sign, to properly sign their malware, right? What benefit do they get? Because Avery is just, uh, because the malware, as a properly signed, Avery is uh, typically just uh, bypass Avery, uh, by, uh, by, uh, didn't check the, didn't check the uh, scanning, uh, didn't check the signed malware, yeah. Right, but is that the sole reason why a malware author would uh, sign his malware? Is it just to evade AVs? Or does he gain some sort of functionality in the operating system where this will run? Like, what are, what are the benefits other than this sort of evasion of AV detection? Oh, sure. So, win win Windows, actually, if we go to the, the slide, the first the example is uh, because the, the program is not properly signed. The first in the, in the figures, in the, the above, says that the file is generated unknown. But if we have the uh, malware is assigned it properly, the window shows that it's the verified publishers and it shows the publisher name. So, and the clients tend to believe that and this is a program is a legitimate and they're published by the publishers. That's why the authors, the malware authors are trying to get the certificate to sign their malware. So it's like positive feedback, is that? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, Bob Akaminazad from Stony Brook University. Uh, so first, I want to point out, I think for malware to get driver level per permissions, they need to have valid signatures. Um, but for targeted attacks like Stuxnet, they go about, you know, uh, reaching into uh, PKI, you know, services to get private keys and sign their malware. And usually when we detect them, the operation is already over. So how does this uh, pipeline that you showed help us uh, to, you know, get the keys that are already, you know, used in malware types to, you know, block them probably because they already, you know, done with their main operation. So can you say the question? I can get the question. Uh, so targeted malware attacks that use uh, stolen private keys to sign uh -huh. their malware uh, are already done with their operation by the time they get, you know, publicly detected. Okay. Uh, so uh, knowing these, you know, stolen samples doesn't really, I think, doesn't really help us to, you know, do anything with those malware samples. Yeah, but the, the thing is, actually, the, unlike the, unlike the WebPKIs, the code sign certificate is not, is not binded to common name. So, so the publishers, actually, the author, the owners of a certificates cannot realize that the where and why and where the certificates are abused. That's why, so it is a big difference between WebPKI and code certificates. Thank you for your great work. I really enjoyed it. My question is, uh, do you have any sort of evidence that the same certificates were also used in web? Not used, for used to, used to, sorry, used the word. In web, for TLS, for example. Oh, yeah, definitely, because I searched the same serial numbers, and then because we found that uh, Sens Census.io, this is where the repository where they collect so the TLS certificates are collected, and then we figured out that some uh, TLS, some web certificate, web, web website use the code sign certificate because they are code sign certificates, and the TLS certificates are based on the X509 V3 the certificates. So that's why people tend to miss, uh, cannot di differentiate between two certificates. But you know, WebPKI, the common name is not the match as your domain name. That's why in that Chrome says, Chrome or web browser say it is a valid, invalid. Yeah. All right, let's do one last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, the, um, mal as a guy that is working in, uh, as in, in the malware industry and mm -hmm. actually antivirus uh, developing, you know, uh, most of the malwares today using the UAC by bypass techniques uh, instead of uh, trying to forging the certificates or st stealing, you know, stealing certificates is somehow hard, but most of them, if you consider even in the WannaCry, uh, they are using some UAC bypass techniques to uh, bypassing this uh, user, user account control, you know? Um, yeah. But what's your, actually, um, you know, forging the certificates or st stealing certificate is not always a good idea in these days. Oh yeah, that's true. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ways to 
you know, the, for adversary to exploit the flawless is AV detection or, you know, the client side of weakness. But we're going to, in this slide, we want to focus on the code inside certificate. And then one of the, the main reason is that, you know, the private key was stolen and they used to assign malware. So, you know, because it doesn't matter that if you have certificate or not, I'm just injecting my code in a program that actually does not check for the checksum of his code section. So I can simply run my program in the Mozilla Corporation, for example, uh, context process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, All right, yeah. great. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, and this concludes the session.